All right, so I've started recording. And <clears throat> I figured since we talked about the questions last time, then we're going to go ahead and pick up, you know, how to answer these questions. What is that about? Can you guys see the screen breaking down the questions? Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's start with let's move on to the next question. So I kind of started with all the select all that apply rules. And hang on, that wasn't the place I wanted to go. Hold on a second. Hold on one second. I wanted to start with how to understand the questions first. That's where I really wanted to go. All right, there we go. I had to make a rearrangement real quick. Right now we can start back where I wanted to. We have a few more people joining. All right, so let's share screen. And there's still folks joining, so I'll be stopping in between to let them in. All right, so that started there, but that's not where I wanted to go. I want to start here. And it still started where I didn't want to go. There we go. All right, so first and foremost, you want to determine what the question is asking. So what are the ways that you guys can do that? First, read the question more than once. Even if you think you know the answer, still read it a second time. If you can't find the answer, then look at making it more simple. So, you know, if there's, and we're going to go through some questions at the end, I have sample questions. So that way you understand it. Don't try to reinterpret it. Still stick with the information that you actually have listed in the question. Then you're going to break the question down into easier um, terms or verbiage that helps you stay focused on making sure you answer the question more accurately then anything that's irrelevant, so any irrelevant pieces, you know, extra stuff that's not needed, like the patients in the ICU, though that's kind of irrelevant information. It's kind of nice to know, but 
being in the ICU necessarily isn't going to change your treatment and your assessment, checking for safety. It's not going to change anything of that nature. So look at, is there any information that's provided about the client is, that's not relevant to the facts for you to answer the question? So whether they're in ICU or not has absolutely nothing to do with your ability or inability to answer the question. It, it's just a location. They could have all been sitting at home. Okay. After you have decided, um, you know, the relevant information about the client and what the question's asking, then consider rephrasing the question to make it more clear. So again, take away the jargon, you know, put it in more simple terms and don't, you know, if you can find a situation where it eliminates a person and this is, if it says like all folks, well, you know that it's not going to always be all people. Does that make sense? Yes, maybe you're thinking about it. Yes, it makes sense. Okay. I was wondering if I had my, my computer on mute because I've done that a couple times. So that's why I was like, okay, let me double check that. All right. So once you get all your information now you select your answer choice and then you're going to choose the best answer so it's always going to be the best answer there's four or five strategies first the nursing process maslow's hierarchy of needs client safety principles of therapeutic communication and then standards of care and we're going to go through each of these individually so when you're looking at the nursing process is what is the question asking a nurse to do in this situation? So we're going to use the nursing process to determine those steps. Is it asking about the client's needs? Is it asking about Maslow's hierarchy of, of order? You know, does it indicate it's a safety issue? But we're looking at assessment. We're looking at um, evaluation, interpretation you know, then our decision making. So that's what we're looking at there. If the question involves communicating with the client, then you're going to use therapeutic communication. If it involves a nursing procedure, then you're going to look at standards of care. What would be the standards of care related to that procedure? If it's asking for an action, then you go with your scope of practice. First and foremost, if you're already out there in the field and you're working, then you have to forget about what you do when you're at your respective job because that is that particular organization. So you have to go back to what does your book say for, uh, you know, like NCLEX, what would, in, this, if this was an NCLEX question, you know, what would they do? So take your job out. All right, so looking at Maslow's hierarchy, it's looking at, you know, what are tools vital for, um, you know, life. So physiologic needs versus psychosocial needs. And we're going to meet those physiological needs first. Okay. <clears throat> so ABCs to help you prioritize. If this is not an airway breathing circulation issue, then we move on to the next piece. So, you know, you guys had a question on the exam that talked about somebody in anaphylactic or that had anaphylaxis. And although airway is appropriate to, 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 would be appropriate if, to look at, but what is going to stop the inflammatory process or the anaphylaxis, or at least start to minimize that is going to be the epinephrine. We're still gonna monitor ABCs, but we had to leave the ABC realm because what was most appropriate for that patient was to stop the reaction as much as possible. So it'd be like the burning process. If someone had burns and the first thing you're gonna do is stop the burning process, then evaluate airway breathing circulation. All right, client safety. So after physiological needs have been met, then safety concerns can be addressed. And always, and even with NCLEX, the client safety takes high priority. So if there's always a, 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 if there's an answer choice and it's about safety, then that's more than likely the answer of choice. So even if you're doing high, the Maslow's hierarchy, 
your, your safety of your client is always going to be paramount. So you use your the, the safety criteria for situations like lab values, um, drug administration, nursing procedures, and then usually if there's a question that's making you choose between addressing the needs of the client or addressing equipment, you know, equipment can wait. It's always the client first. So, and we don't leave clients by themselves. So just, you know, kind of keep that in mind. But only after the safety concerns are met then, then we look at the therapeutic communication and things of that nature. So we're kind of going down in that order. All right, speaking on therapeutic communication. So whether it's verbal or nonverbal, it's going to involve these key things. First, you need to listen to the client. So not think about this is what the client is saying. You need to really understand what the client is saying. So understand what their needs are. And if you don't understand quite clearly, then have the patient clarify. Then you look at you know, the patient's, uh, the client's condition and move forward. But uh, you know, there was a question on the last test that had uh, the woman who, I can't remember what her immunity problem was, but she knew already because of her condition, she would be tired, but her concern was for how, was for her family. How am I going to take care of these kids when I am fatigued? She knows she's going to be fatigued, but, you know, addressing the fatigue and leaving her kiddos out because that really was her concern. So look at, is this a condition for which this person is going to be fatigued and this person is identi has identified that? which she did, she acknowledged that she knew she was going to be fatigued, but what her concern was is, how do I manage my kiddos during that time? So eliminate options that indicate poor therapeutic communication techniques, and then make your selection. Look for responses that allow the client time to think and reflect, for them to talk, um, encourage them to describe a particular experience, and then you know, reflect that, that you have listened to the client such through paraphrasing. So let me repeat or let me tell you what I think I'm hearing you say. So that way you know for an assurity exactly what the person's saying. And that's how a lot of these questions are driven. Standards of care, all right, delegation. Who can you delegate to? What can you delegate to an individual? So making sure that whatever you delegate to a person to stay the patient is client of uh, the client is stable um you know there's unchanging procedures like inos that they can measure blood pressures they can measure they can get a pulse ox now they can't interpret it but they can tell you what the numbers are so bathing and feeding those are usually things that are kind of standard that can be delegated things you don't delegate you can't go have them go and assess a patient they can't evaluate a patient they can't titrate any fluids for you. So those are the things that cannot be done. Now, if it's, you know, especially if it's a vasoactive drip like dopamine, you can't have an LPN do that either. So although LPNs, they will assess folks, it has to be followed up with a nursing. Um, the nurses have to sign off on the assessment as well. And they can't do new patients. So they can't do an intake of those individuals without oversight for a nurse. Anything that requires your nursing judgment, those things cannot be delegated. So everything falls on the nurse at this point, the RN. So if the correct answer is to notify the healthcare physician, then make sure that the client's safety needs have been met before calling the physician. So like leaving people by themselves and things of that nature. So you need to make sure somebody's there with the patient. Um, make sure that you know your lab values and then diagnostic tools that are specific for a particular condition, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's have two diagnostic tools that, are, that differ, but they both, uh, the, each diagnostic tool indicates that, you know, this is ulcerative colitis, this is Crohn's. So know which ones are best indicators for those conditions. Um, if you have, you know, multiple responses, then 
all of the answers in that multiple response must be correct. So if it's one part of the answer is correct, and when they get to, you know, it's this, this, and this, and if that third one is incorrect, the whole answer is not correct even if they had two correct answers in it. So all answers must be correct in order for it to be correct. And just like NCLEX, we don't give any partial credit scoring on those items. So this is when you're looking at, you know, select all that applies. All right, so speaking about select all that applies. <clears throat> Usually they'll have about four to six answer choices, although I have five, I had to go back. Uh, we usually do five if it's going to be a select all that apply. And sometimes it could be four. So you have options. How do you answer those? First, you look at the question type because it, it'll tell you, hey, this is select all that apply. And usually when you see it, you're going to get anxious. That's usually the next thing that happens when you see a select all that apply. And they're usually kind of long. So here are some tips to help you strategize with select all that applies. First, what is the question asking? We should read the question two times, make sure we understand it, and then look at things that are relevant facts about the client. And then if you have something with a, you know, blood pressure of 190 over uh, 80, heart rate's 33, and they have irregular respirations that's, you know, chain stokes, then what should you be thinking in your mind? Now, this is a question for you. Nobody? You got this, guys, come on. We just did it on, on Wednesday. All right, so you have a patient with a blood pressure of 190 over 90, heart rate's 33, they have irregular re respirations, which is chain stokes. And I'm just giving you an example. What should you be thinking? And so, Yasmin, congratulations to you. You should be thinking Cushing's triad. Now, had I said hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular respirations, you guys would have got that, but I switched it and I gave you the actual numbers for which it would be, which would be, I said 190 over 90, 33, and irregular respirations. And I said chain stokes, because that is one of the types. And then I asked you what conditions should you be thinking? So, you know, you have to know what Cushing's triad is in a numeric form versus So are those two not the same? The two that's under that I wrote 190 over 90 33 irregular respirations and then I have hypertension bradycardia irregular respirations are those two not the same okay those two are the same so you guys have to know it in a numeric format and you know, if you saw this on a monitor, on a patient's monitor, what would you really be looking at? Besides saying, oh wow, that blood pressure is really high. It's kind of weird and they have bradycardia. You know, all right, my blood pressure is high. You know, this is bradycardia. All right, there, this breathing looks irregular. Then what are, what, what am I looking at? They are the same and one is more specific. That is correct, Nikki. So, You have to know both ways. You have to know what that hypertension would really be 
you have to know what the bradycardia would really be, not just hypertension, bradycardia, irregular respirations. Right, so you know, what is increased ICP? So this would be an example of it, and there's a plethora of conditions that can put them in this position. So stroke, tumor, hydrocephalus. So we, we, have, some, we have some potentials. Okay, so coming back to, you know, this question here, I mean, it could have easily have been um, a set of, you know, so we'll, we'll make this a select all that apply and say, you know, which of the following signs and symptoms would be indicative of Cushing's triad? And this could have very well looked like this. Okay, it could have said, uh, oops, I'm typing by the way. I'm gonna put some letters in front of it. typing so don't panic yet. Almost done. I'm doing the last one. Okay, so I'm asking you, what is Cushing's triad? Which of those answer choices would be correct? A, B, C, D, E. And this is a select all that apply. There, that's for me, to, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me copy it because I did it to the people in the waiting area. Control copy. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. I want it to go to everyone in the meeting, not everyone in the waiting area. Here we go. Small, small thing. There we go. A, B, C, D, or E. And this is a select all that apply. or SATA. So which of those five answer choices would be indicators of central of uh, Cushing's triad? Heart rate. I'm just reposting it again because I'm, I'm starting to lose it. Okay, there we go. All right, so has everyone, have everyone answered? All right, so the answer is B and C only. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, that's why I clarified it and put HR. So B and C are the only are the only two choices. Tachycardia, no. So if you chose D, remember it's bradycardia. Upnea, basically EU means normal. So when you see EU in front of like euvolemia, that means normal volume. Okay. Yeah, B was, resp yeah, it wasn't respirations. I, I did not have the RR or HR, so I get it. But if you had D associated with it, which was tachycardia, that would still be incorrect. And there were several Ds initially, and D was tachycardia. There was a couple of E's, and E's were, um, that's just normal breathing. And if you don't know something, you know, Medical terms are definitely something to uh, that you have to know because this book is riddled with them. But you know, A means without or no, right? And then you know, Brady and Tacky, but you, you kind of think about it, right? Okay. So as we're saying here, then choose the best options for before you enter your answer. But you know, know that you got to know the facts to make sure you're correct. All right. So let's do some sample questions. All right. So you have a male client. He feels he has feelings of sadness, and he's seeking questions for strategies to keep active after the loss of the spouse. Which of the uh, which activities might the nurse suggest to the client? All right, so let's break it down before you start answering anything. We have a person that is sad after a loss of a spouse. This would be what condition? Let's start with that. What condition do you think he, he may have? Okay, grief or depression. I can go with either one of those, okay? And now he's trying to not go down the rabbit's hole. So he's asking for some suggestions to keep him active because he's locked, lost his loved one. So which of these five would be appropriate for this gentleman? Okay, so let's break it down. We have a gentleman that's had a loss. We know that after losses, depression is definitely a concern and he's gonna be depressed because of the loss. But what we don't want him to end up with is, you know, like significant depression, okay? So what are some things that are listed here that will prevent him from isolating himself and becoming further depressed? If he did a golf league at the club, okay, because then that golf league would mean you would see people interact with folks. Attend regular spiritual uh, church services. There's always a congregation, so that would be multiple people he could tap into, chat with, you know, uh, maybe make, go to lunch with or do walks or things of that nature. Walk at sunrise at a local track. What, okay, you can do that, but usually at sunrise, most people are not out there walking but this would mean he may be by himself and it didn't say with a group of people, right? Attending a midday movie at the theater, although there's a stack of people in movie theaters, well, not right now because of Corona, but usually there's a, you know, a plethora of folks there, you know, he's there by himself. He didn't go with another individual. Participating in a community charity event. Okay, so you're doing a charity event for the community. That means the community, his neighbors would be involved and he would be able to interact with other individuals. So this would give more options for him to interact. Does that make sense on how to answer that, that question? 
So that's how you break a question down bit by bit. And then your choices should have been one, two, and five. Okay. All right, so let's hit the second one. So here's the rationale. So it's common after a loss to experience sadness related to the grieving process and have difficulty socializing independently. So participating with other individuals in team related sports or religious activities and a common goal at a charity event are client directed activities which connect the client to other folks. So, all right, so basically as I talked it through on the scenario. So here's some strategies again. Analyze to determine what information the question is asking. Uh, compare each option to accomplish, you know, the nursing goal. Ask yourself what would increase the client's mood and provide social interaction, thus decreasing loneliness. And then look at all the, the activity choices that will decrease sadness but increase his participation. And then choose your answer. All right, here's another one. So the nurse is caring for a client who is experiencing an exacerbation of gout. When providing instructions, which dietary modifications are stressed, okay? So eat a low purine diet, limit fluid intake to no more than a liter per day, eat a high protein diet, at least two servings of lean meat per day, eat a high purine diet, and then limit alcohol intake. So if you know anything about gout, it's usually be, you know, because the body can't clear the purines. So anything like organ meats are high in purines. So we want to consider what we're asking them to do, okay? Um, should we limit fluid intake if we're trying to flush things out and help the gout get better? No. So your answer choices should be one and five. Does that make sense? So when you see the select all that apply, instead of pushing that, you know, that panic button, just, you know, read the question. What is this about? We have a person with gout. It's a flare up. And now we're talking about dietary regimen. Okay, what do I know about gout? Well, I know that, you know, it's caused because of da 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 da. This is why I do a lot about that pathophysiology, because if you know what, what the rationale or the reason why, it'll tell you. Also, the causes, that etiology. So that way, if you see things like that, you know, it's from high purines, then you should be able, oh, no, we don't need to give them high purines, we need to do low. And definitely alcohol intake is another factor that we want to tell him to limit. Okay, so again, gout is characterized by abnormal metabolism of uric acid. So they either produce too much or the body's unable to clear it or excrete it. Purines are metabol metabolized into uric acid. So if they suffer from gout, they're gonna be on a low purine diet with foods such as peanut butter, cherries, rice, pastas, fruits, veggies. Fluids do not have to be limited. Alcohol intake would be limited as it is thought to trigger the exacerbation. So test taking strategies again. So look at what the question's asking for. You know, consider each option to decide its merit. And then look at the dietary modifications that relate to the production of uric acid and relate to low purine diet. And then make your selection choice. Um, you could, you could encourage, but it's not, a, you know, if, if anything, it would be more water than your, your other, your other drinks. So that would not be against the rules to help flush things out. All right, so here we have, and this is, you know, usually one of those, you, you have a, a graphic. So here's an, uh, you're caring for a client who sustained a head injury during a football game. Now don't judge, he do look a little bit too, you know, older than to be playing football, but you know, it could have been flag football, but it doesn't matter. The nurse is completing the following examination. Which documentation by the nurse provides normal results of this examination? So what is she doing? 
What is she examining? She's examining pupils. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to give you the answer choices. And it's only one answer. So the client's pupils are equal reactive to light and accommodate. The client's retina is attached with no signs of tearing. The client's vision is 2020, or the client's visual field is 360. Okay. That was relatively simple. It's an assessment question. Now, what if it said, you know, she's checking the pupils and it had that the uh, one of the answer choices was um, was unequal pupils, sluggish reaction, um, So now I'm asking, you know, the pay, and this is, we're going to go back to the original question. So which documentation by the nurse provides, and I'm going to say abnormal results of this examination. I'm changing the verbiage to abnormal results of this patient. And so we're going to go back to these answer choices. And then I'm going to add in, this would be five, six, and seven. So, oops. If I could spell pupils right, that would be fantastic. Let's see. So this is going to be five, and this is going to be six, and this is going to be seven. All right, so now we're just going to add these three on to these option choices. And of those option choices, this is going to be a select all that apply. So we're talking, we're related to the head injury. So head injury, because this is what he had. We're keeping everything the same. We're just changing it to abnormal results. So which of the five, seven now would be abnormal related to a head injury? five and six, because we're just looking at head injury. We're not looking at anything else. I didn't, I didn't ask about drugs or anything. So all I wanted to know, what would be abnormal if you had a patient that had a head injury and you saw this, what would you be thinking? It would be five and six. So the unequal pupils and sluggish reaction, okay? So you got that right. I think this was pretty straightforward. We want them equal round reactive and accommodation. So this we don't assess retinas and you know 20. We may look if not if the patient had an eye injury. If they had an eye injury, then we would be concerned about their ability to read. You know, what can they see? What would be their vision? Is it 20, 30, 40, 60, 80? Can't see anything. That would be more appropriate. So identify the type of test to be performed. Uh, we got the flashlight. Second, recall that the light, uh, when we shine a light, it causes the pupils to constrict, indicating normal neurologic function. Okay, so here we have one that's making you make, make a priority choice. So you have a kiddo with a concussion and they're discharged following an MRI of the brain. Before discharge, the patient reports or client reports that um, a headache. The mother questions pain medication for home. Which response by the nurse is most appropriate? Then read your answer choices. And once you read your answer choice, then make your decision. This is only one answer, most appropriate. That means there's no more, there's only one. Two may be, you know, could be an option but we want the best answer that's most appropriate.
All right, so the fourth answer choice here would not be a appropriate. And you probably would between one and three. And then of course, you know, I had to put and move my little toolbar and I ended up moving the whole answer or to the next screen. But they have a mild concussion. They could give acetaminophen. Why acetaminophen? It is the safest. Why not three? What, what throws three out? Okay, so three wasn't the aspirin, two was the aspirin, so, but I agree with you. But what throws out, when you say pain medication, what is what kind of pain medication usually would they be speaking about? Opioids, and we definitely don't want to give the kiddo opioids, narcotics, because we do want to be able to see if there's any deficits in the brain. And that op the opioids would definitely be something that we that would prevent us from getting a clear picture. Okay. So, following the MRI, uh, it is confirmed that there is no bleeding. Pain medication can be administered. For headaches, opioids can mask changes in level of consciousness that indicate increased ICP. Aspirin contraindicated because it may involve bleeding, such as traumatic injuries, et cetera. And then if they're less than five, they can develop um, RISE syndrome, which is something we don't want to do, okay? Which is an abnormal accumulation of fat um, and it really damages the brain. It really causes mitochondrial injury. So, we can analyze to determine the information, which is pain medication for a mild concussion. Once the risk um, of intracranial bleeding is cleared, then we can eliminate option three, uh, eliminate option two related to Rye syndrome in the client's age. Option four is, is correct, but option one answers the mother's question and is the best answer choice. because it doesn't specify. So when you say pain medication, this is a very good question, Michelle. When anytime someone says pain medication, the first thing you should be thinking is opioids. Cause that's usually the first thing that's, oh my goodness, what am I doing? Um, that's usually the first thing that a physician or any healthcare provider. Um, for a kid, yeah, kiddos get pain meds too. So it's not, no one thinks of pain medication for, um, uh, as just being an NSAID. Otherwise, they'll say NSAIDs or they will say acetaminophen. And this is why they're being more specific because they're taking out the fact that we have better options even before we get to an opioid. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh my goodness, I'm going crazy. All right, so let me clear this here. I have too many windows open, so we got that. I went back in time. All right, we have another kid up. Now this is something you guys are studying now. So following a VP shunt, so a ventricular peritoneal shunt, it goes from the brain to the stomach, or the abdominal cavity for hydrocephalus, which intervention would a nurse perform first? So let's, so now we just got the kiddo back to the pediatric unit from a procedure. They just had a ventricular peritoneal shunt place. What should you do first? have answers between two and four. <laughs> I want to say four. <laughs> I mean, those are the ones I'm seeing primarily is two and four. 
Okay, so let's see. We're going to put the kiddo on the opposite side of the shunt. So now we're going to talk about why. So they should be placed on the opposite side of the surgical site to prevent pressure on the shunt valve. INOs eventually will get to that. Uh, usually there's nothing by mouth until, you know, um, unless an NG tube is placed. Uh, so that's going to be, an, that's, you know, that's going to be out. Pain medication should be administered by an intravenous route initially postoperatively versus PO because they would be in PO after a surgical procedure anyway. Make sense? Okay. So again, test taking strategies, determine what information is being asked. Know the priorities post-op for a VP shunt, and then consider safety needs following surgery and your immediate nursing actions. So if you're, you know, had difficulty answering that one, look at you know immediate post-operative period for VP shunts, and that will help clear this up. All right, so here's one of those. Uh, you know, delegation or roles and responsibilities of the RN. So you are a charge nurse, which assignment would be appropriate? So you have some personnel that you're giving assignments to, which of these would be appropriate? Not what you do in practice. And this is not a select all that applies, so it's only going to be one. You have to decide. Yeah, usually if it's select all that apply, you'll see that written there. Okay. So our answer is one. Uh, even though the person may be a senior level nursing student, you know, cystic fibrosis requires a lot of treatment. And if they're getting a lot of meds, that could be very overwhelming. An LPN or an LVN, depending on which area of the country you're from, we just talked about newly admits and blood transfusions. Okay. Nursing assistant, uh, they should not be taking anybody that's having frequent seizures that they need a nurse to be um, with them in order for that to happen. So number four would be out. So, you know, an RN would make frequent assessments to provide the right level of care. Student nurses, even at a senior level, may not be allowed to give medications without supervision, and it may be easier for the RN or the LPN to um, care for this client. In many states, LPNs or LVNs are not allowed to initiate blood products, a client transfer to a unit with a head injury needing frequent assessment that only a licensed nurse would be able to provide. So know your role, your scope of practice um, and nursing career ladders and who can do what. So review nursing career ladders um, so that you know what your roles and responsibilities are. All right, so we have another one, meningococcal. Meningitis develops signs of sepsis and a purpuric rash over the lower extremities. So they already have meningitis, but now they develop this rash. So a primary health care provider would be notified immediately because this rash is indicative of what complication or, or which complication. It's only one answer.
All right, so let's talk about it. So we have a patient that has meningitis, okay? And now they develop signs of sepsis and a purpuric rash over the bilateral lower extremities. Now your answer choices is, you know, adhesive arachnoiditis, okay, inflammation of the arachnoid that's sticky. Um, an onset of SIADH, well, we, would have, we, we wouldn't get a rash with SIADH. Severe allergic reaction to the antibiotic regimen with impending anaphylaxis. Can you show me in here where it said the patient was receiving an antibiotic? Somebody goes, ugh, I knew it. <laughs> so the answer is meningococcemia. Once you get that purpuric rash, and this is basically, a, this is the patient is getting worse. So when they start seeing purpura and petechiae, that's not a good sign. That means this is a complication of meningitis and the patient's becoming more septic because now it is in, it's, it's not just in the meninges, it's also in the blood. Does that make sense? Emia. Okay. So this is a serious complication, usually associated with a meningococcal infection. A client with severe allergic reaction and impending anaphylaxis would most likely have signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, GI, hypotension, hives, itching, et cetera. SIADH can be an acute complication, but it would also be, a it would not be accompanied with a purpuric rash. And then the um, adhesive arachnoiditis occurs in chronic phase of the disease and leads to obstruction of cerebral spinal fluid. So you would actually have signs and symptoms related to that, okay? But the rash part is more now, this has moved into the bloodstream. So again, you may not have looked at meningitis yet, but I'm quite sure after this, you probably will. All right, so we have a person, now this is a select all that apply. Chronic hypertension, they struggle to be compliant with medications because of financial issues. When reviewing recent lab work results, which of the following basically reflects the client's blood pressure issues? Now this is kind of a surface question. And I'll tell you what I mean by surface question, because this, this exact same question could be changed to BUN is, and then give a lab value. CBC or a specific process of the CBC is this lab value. Creatinine is this lab value. Um, a specific cardiac enzyme, so CKMB is blah, blah, blah. So you gotta know the normals, but go ahead. So of these six, which would be appropriate? So we have one, three, and four, okay. Okay. All right. So, you know, remember hypertension would be, we are, we've talked about it with stroke. And then you also had it in second semester in perfusion and you'll probably, and you'll get some more of that again in fourth level. So let's look at it. One, three, and six are your, I think there was a couple, Michelle, Brittany, there was a few that had had the one, three, and six. Some of you knew one and three for sure. You just weren't quite clear on, you know, six. You may have looked down and was like, eh. But um, ALT is more of your liver, 
liver functions. Cardiac is heart, and this will be for heart attack though. CBC, the chronic hypertension doesn't really affect that in a meaningful way. So those three would kind of be, they would be out of the, taken out of the ballpark. So usually CBC is gonna tell you if your red blood cell counts are high or low, your white cell counts are high or low, your thrombocytes or your platelets are high or low, and then look at anemia and things of that nature if you have like sickle cell and things uh, along those lines. Or if you have an infectious process, looking at the neutrophils or the eosinophils. So, um, you know, the financial issues can lead to an inability to afford the medication, but chronic issues with hypertension, you know, would be the reason why the person has the chronic issues is because they can't afford it. So BUN and creatinine looks at kidney function, which is usually kind of one of those uh, complications with uh, uh, if you don't have your blood pressure managed appropriately. So those are reflective of chronic hypertension. Calcium levels uh, fluctuate because it leaves the bone. So calcification of major blood vessels in the body can happen. It's not reflective in CBC. Cardiac enzymes may indicate an infarction. And then the, L the ALT is your liver enzyme. So it's gonna look at the liver. So we have damage to the kidneys causing renal perfusion. And usually that's what most renal failure is related to is um, hypertension and you know, untreated or uncontrolled or complicated or chronic. So your serum phosphate levels and calcium levels have a reciprocal relationship. So if your calcium is, you know, low, your phosphorus would be what? High. Yes, we got that part. Yay. All right. So subarachnoid hemorrhage. So now we're giving them a thousand milligram loading dose of phenotoin intravenously. And phenotoin, the other word for that is dilantin. So which consideration is most important? So this is only one answer when administering the dose. All right, so we have, we have an option of primarily twos, okay? And that is correct. So anytime you give a medication, so you know when you, hey, I'm gonna give you your medication and it can cause, you know, GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, would this be applicable information for this patient based on what you, what you have just learned about phenotoin? No, it would not be. And the reason being is that um, that's the least of our concerns. We wanna know what are the things that's gonna harm the patient and literally put them in cardiac arrest or put them in a, uh, in a complicated situation where they could go into cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest or have a stroke or anything like that. Those types of complications are your bigger, your bigger issue. And since we're given this loading dose, you know, they're giving it IV, we can't give this rapidly. So your third level students, and when you get to fourth level, 
and you start doing those clinicals, you, you will be able to do IV pushes, but you have to look that stuff up. Minimum push rate if it is not a cardiac arrest. So if it is not a cardiac arrest event that you are doing an IV push in, you start at two minutes. And some of them are five minutes for administration, which means you need to have the bed up, you know, so your back isn't bent over. You need to be in a good position and you need to be giving this slowly, literally like a half a mil every 30 seconds. And then, you know, you know, waiting, you, so you just can't fast push it. So this is definitely, you know, a concern. Even Lasix being given too fast can actually cause a person to have hearing loss. So I wouldn't give a rats about that nausea vomiting if I can't hear. So give them the things that, you know, we need to, you need to know to monitor for. So that way you're not pushing things, you know, too quickly or you know just putting it on a pump and expecting the pump to you know to function correctly so we do have some um, responsibility with that so here it would not be given at a rate be, uh, above 50 milligrams per minute because rapid administration can depress the myocardium and we can now end up in a cardiac arrhythmia so therapeutic ranges is between 10 and 20 milligrams per milliliter and it uh, would not be mixed in solution for administration. So because it's compatible with normal saline, it can be injected through an IV line that has normal saline. Make sense? It may cause a purple glove syndrome. So what is purple glove syndrome? And not those little cute gloves that you can wear, you know, not those. It's a skin disease. So the extremities will become swollen and discolored. And it could be significant enough to the, to the point that the patient may have to get their extremity amputated. So this is something that's common in patients that are receiving uh, phenotoin, and even if they have epilepsy. So anytime that medication is given IV, then we want to make sure that we're not going to put the patient at another risk. All right, so your knowledge of phenotoin and adverse effects are essential to answer this question. So if unsure, note that cardiac arrhythmias are the most dangerous outcomes of therapy and, only, and the only outcome noted in the options. Any questions? That was, our, that was our last sample question. Do you, do you find this helpful to the cause? Can we do this again next Saturday? I don't have a problem with that. All right, so let's look at the uh, I want to look at the case study. Uh, you had an ischemic stroke case study. So let's go, did you, have you done the case studies? So we're going to look at that case study that we did or that I sent out. So it's at least that's information that you, you know, we covered in class a pretty good length. We, so this should be, you know, pretty appropriate here. So I'm going to open it up and then I'm going to share my screen. All right, so let me share screen and then we'll rock and roll on this one. Yes, go ahead with your question, Michelle. Um, I have a question. You had the very first thing you said something about the anaphylaxis and the, giving the epinephrine first. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when our teacher was teaching us that 
exemplar or whatever, she said to do the airway first. You have to stop the reaction. Okay. I'm not saying that airway is not important. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, but so I'm that just confused me. Because so. I don't know how quickly that anaphylaxis is going to amp or how, okay. you know, how quickly it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen when I say amp, like amp up. Right. So the first thing to do is to give them the epinephrine. And you okay. are going to still assess for, for airway, but you can see in your patient, because I think that was about how to treat it. You know, what do you, I think it was a treatment question. So looking at the okay. treatment question, then that would be anaphylaxis. I mean, not anaphylaxis, that would be epinephrine for the anaphylaxis. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you have a patient, okay, so say for instance, you put the oxygen on and you're gonna have to put the oxygen on regardless. This is asking you to make a decision, which one of these two come first. So let's stop the process. Let's give them the medication because they don't go unconscious though. But what we're trying to stop is epi if we have anaphylaxis, our, we have bronchoconstriction, we have mucus production, we have vasodilation that's happening, we have urticaria, hives, et cetera. So the whole system's kind of busting out. So before we tank out completely, we have something that we could give. We can give epinephrine that can cause vasoconstriction to increase blood pressure. We have um, epinephrine that also works on those beta receptors to help with bronchodilation versus bronchi to fix bronchoconstriction, so relax the smooth muscles. And we also have that epinephrine that's used to increase the heart rate and increase contractility of the heart. So that would be the, that would be the first piece of it. You still would have already looked at airway, but there wouldn't have been a whole lot that you could do for it if you don't stop where the problem's coming from. Does that make sense? Okay. So I gave that example, same thing with burns. The first thing you do is stop the burning process, get all the jewelry off, take all the restrictive clothing off. So that way, you know, if that tissue continues to swell, now we don't end up with amputated fingers and things of that nature, but you've got to stop the burning process. You have to cool the burn. And then you're going to, you know, you look at all those other pieces. So I'm not saying airway isn't important. I'm just saying we got to look at stopping what's causing the problem. So it'd be no different if your person had, your client had a, um, they had a pulsating, they have blood that's coming from their neck and it was pulsating. What would you address first? And then why? So I'm asking everybody. So your, your patient, say you were an ER nurse you, and your patient came in, uh, they, were, they were stabbed in the neck or whatever. And so they're coming in and they have this pulsating blood. What would be the first thing you would do? You're gonna stop the bleeding because number one, that's a safety issue with blood spurting everywhere. So that's the other reason why. So sometimes you have to stop a process, then you get your ABCs, because now I wanna know, okay, I've stopped this hole. Okay, let me see where this person is. They have an airway, they've got their breathing, they have circulation. So sometimes you go a smidgen out of order for the treatment thereof. It didn't mean that you didn't assess it, but we already know what the signs and symptoms were already there. So you already knew what you were working with in that particular question, Michelle. All right, I'm gonna share the systemic stroke and then we'll, we'll talk about that and then see if you have any other um, questions. Wrap up those case studies so we can work on those as well uh, on Wednesday. All right, so let's look at our ischemic stroke lady. All right, so Ms. Kennedy, she's brought to the emergency room by her daughter who was visiting her house for lunch and notice that she seemed confused. So remember I said those ischemic strokes that used to go to bed, A-OK, -okay, so you'd have talked to them the day before, everything seemed fine, and the next day, you know, something is off. Okay, now she's confused. She does not have a history of confusion. However, she lives alone, and her daughter is concerned that she does not take care of herself. Let me move that up a little bit more. 
got bigger. So um, she does have diabetes, high cholesterol, and a smoker. So are those risk factors for stroke? Absolutely. So when I'm looking at questions, I'm like underlining or highlighting or, you know, somewhere jotting down, you know, that whiteboard, uh, these things. Okay. All right. She has a, during the visit, the daughter's, uh, during the visit, she had trouble walking problem. Okay. Complained of feeling nauseated and dizzy. Okay. That's a problem. She told her daughter that she has had the hiccups for the past days, but cannot remember when she started feeling dizzy or ill. So now we have a change in mental status. Her daughter immediately brought her to the emergency room. So now we examine Ms. Kennedy. And she's now complaining of pain in her left arm and her left leg, and she has left-sided weakness. Okay, so tell me, based on that, where's the deficit, where is her injury? On the right side, perfect. She's unable to maintain her balance, okay? So now we start thinking about lobes for which balance would be, you know, uh, one of their central pieces and requires assistance with getting into bed. A rapid neurology or neurologist assessment also reveals left-sided facial weakness and nystagmus. So we check her vital signs. Heart rate's 88, that's normal. Respiration's 18, that's normal. BP 144 over 90, that's slightly elevated, but it's you know definitely out of our range. Based on her initial exam and symptoms, the physician believes that she may have suffered a stroke. So based on, based on the knowledge, uh, this knowledge of a ischemic stroke develops, which Miss Kennedy's risk factors would have most likely contributed to her condition and why. So, We've already said, diabetes, smoker, and her high cholesterol. Is there anything else? So based on your knowledge of how an ischemic stroke develops, which of the risk factors would have most likely contributed. Remember smoking, the nicotine causes vasoconstriction. The high cholesterol causes, you know, decreases the lumen in the vessel. So that can now, you know, bring on, create turbulent blood flow because it's lined against the vessel wall and the type two diabetes makes it more sticky, right? And her age, 71, yep. So let's look at here. Minimize this here so I know what I'm clicking. Thank you very much. So the type 2 diabetes and high cholesterol are both risk factors. Smoking increases the risk. These risk factors contribute to high blood pressure, which also uh, she had during her assessment. So um, age should, should be a part of that, but there are some people that are older that have not had a stroke. So I think they're looking at more of her lifestyle options in, in past medical history, but ages don't rule that out. So when the heart's unable to get adequate amounts of oxygen and blood flow, then ischemia, remember those three eyes I talked about, injury, ischemia, injury, infarct, that can happen and it can make the situation worse and lead to a heart attack or a stroke. And we're talking about this decreased blood flow from the clogged arteries or vessels because when you have high cholesterol, it's everywhere. It's in the veins, it's in the vessel, in the um, arteries as well. All right, question number two. Okay, which type of factors would Miss Kennedy be able to change with rehabilitation and which ones would not be modifiable? So what did you have for that? Okay, diet and smoking, for sure. All right, so these are the modifiable ones, okay. Which ones are not modifiable? Because she, she can modify the diabetes. No, she can die, she, that one she can. If it was diabetes type one, she could not modify that because that's a congenital condition and she can't change her age. 
but the smoking, the diet, the, the diabetes, those are modifiable, okay? So the diabetes is manageable um, and you know, with lifestyle changes. It also applies to the cholesterol and the smoking. Considering her advanced age, it'll be difficult for her to modify uh, her type two diabetes, but she could decrease her, her process, but her age will be a problem. All right, three. Her daughter brought her to the hospital as soon as she discovered her symptoms, described the importance of seeking care um, quickly after a potential stroke. What could, they, what could they potentially treat her with that's time sensitive if you're out of the window? TPA, correct. So somehow, oh, I don't wanna do that, but okay, let me just get back to here. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, so if she didn't receive care, then she, um, more, it's a possibility that our myocardial cells can now be affected and she could end up with a heart attack as well as now have, you know, not being able to receive the clot buster. So based on her history, it appears that Mrs. Kennedy also had a transient ischemic attack three months ago. Because of the concern for this patient's health, the physician immediately orders a head CT, which is appropriate, where it is determined that she suffered an ischemic stroke affecting the posterior inferior cerebellar artery in the brain. Why cerebellar? What was in her signs and symptoms that told you that this was that this may have been cerebellar uh, driven? Her balance. So remember, I talked about that balance and trouble walking. Okay. All right. So what is the difference between a TIA and an ischemic stroke? difference between a TIA and an ischemic stroke. Okay, TIAs are a mini stroke. Now, TIA is not a hemorrhage. It is still caused from uh, a decreased blood flow, but it's like a precursor to the stroke. So a transient ischemic attack, because that's what TIA stands for, that usually lasts for about 24 hours. Um, and even their treatment would be continue with the aspirin and, and they would not need TPA per se, okay? Uh, can the TIA be reversible without meds? Yes, because if patient starts to get better either with oxygen or something of that nature, but any deficits that they would have had would have uh, been resolved within a 24 hour period. Whereas if you have um, a stroke, even if the patient has resolution, it won't happen within 24 hours. It may happen in 48, 72, 96 hours. Does that make, a, does that make sense? So it's kind of a warning sign that if we don't make some changes now, then we may have some, we may actually end up having the stroke. So it's like angina or angina to a heart attack. So the angina is letting you know, hey, you need to fix some things, make some changes. If you don't, you could be having the big one. So this is what a TIA is to a stroke. So here, it is a mini stroke where the blood flow to the brain um, is only temporary where that Tempor it's a temporary loss, while an ischemic stroke usually uh, results in severe tissue death, and a TIA should not be ignored 
because it's a good indicator of a future stroke. So, but it is, it is a mini stroke. All right, so what information would the nurse provide as part of teaching to prepare Mrs. Kennedy and her daughter to undergo the head CT? Allergies to iodine and shellfish, absolutely. That contrast dye, for sure. And then what about the, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a CT scan done, but you're going through that tunnel, so if she's claustrophobic, that's gonna be traumatic, you know. Um, well, she's at the hospital, she's there now, so if she's eaten, then, you know, that's a whole nother ball game. But we're here, we're going to get these x-rays done. It's going to be in this, this tunnel. And, you know, you got to be really still. It's going to take images of the brain. So it, it'd be all of those things. Um, yep, be quiet. Is it, is, isn't it super quiet? Are you talking about the CT? Um, the machine makes some noise. Yeah, the, the machine makes noise, but they can't It'll, you can hear things beeping and clicking, but you don't necessarily know where it is, but we don't want her to move her head. So we want to educate her, you know, what was, what's going to happen. And then at first we need to know her allergies and if she's claustrophobic, um, you know, it shouldn't take more than 10 to 30 minutes. It is best if the patient doesn't move or else the images will be blurred. So that's the key things we want. We want to make sure that they understand because they are going to go through this little donut hole. And so people really get, they start to freak out about CT scans. All right, so looking at how, uh, explain how the nurse would educate her and the daughter about this type of stroke compared to a hemorrhagic stroke. So basically you're comparing the two. Okay. All right. So basically one is a is a is a clot and the other one is a bleed, right? I think you meant bleeding. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Okay, so you know, here so and uh someone else had it right. Uh there should be a lot there. Oh, Lordy B. Oh, I can't change it here. So uh, disregard the spelling, by the way. So it's a brain aneurysm. Blood begins to leak out and cause swelling, and hence a blockage that prevents normal blood flow to the brain tissues, resulting in brain death. So an ischemic stroke like this patient has was not due to a ruptured brain vessel, but due to a lack of normal blood flow to the brain. And that can also happen where else? The carotid artery? Can that, can that blockage and decrease blood flow happen from the carotid artery, having cholesterol buildup or plaque buildup? Yes. Absolutely. All right, number seven. So here's a case update. So following um, the diagnosis, she's set up to receive IV recumbent tissue plasminogen activator. So that's a clot buster. 
The nurse is administering a bolus dose and then Ms. Kennedy will receive the rest of her dose over the course of the next hour. So um, explain how this works to manage ischemic strokes. Okay, so will it just be that clot or will it be any other clot she has anywhere in her entire body? And you're correct, Jessica, about the, it breaks up the clots. It'd be any other clot. So any other clots that she has, when you're starting that IV line, it, it, will, it will definitely leak out because you know it's an opening, it's an orifice, it's a hole. So make sure you know, you're not sticking them 65,000 times like a pin cushion to get the IV. And they should have at least a 20 or an 18 gauge catheter in, uh, preferably an 18 gauge if you're gonna give TPA. So we don't wanna put in a small catheter in the, in the patient's vein. So it affects the clotting factors and other components involved with clotting that is most likely to cause an ischemic attack. So TPA is all a common protein in the lining of the blood's vessels to help break it down. So we're just gonna give a bigger dose of it. Oops, so based on the mechanism of action, what factors would prevent Ms. Kennedy from being a candidate to receiving TPA? And this is important. So uh, it helps to break the, okay. Recent surgery, yep. Bleeding problems, head injury. Uh, those will all be appropriate for not, you know, uh, the TIA that she had, that's another one, timing if it's out of, out of whack. So she had had a recent stroke or recent surgery, then they would, it, it, even though she had that TIA. So let's see. All right, here we go. So she, if she's had any other bleeding disorders, ulcers, um, on blood thinners, uncontrolled bleed, uh, blood pressure, then these are some of the things that will prevent her from being a candidate and also being out the treatment window, which I believe is like four to six hours, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so let's see what number nine says. So what signs or symptoms indicate a positive outcome that the TPA has been effective as, uh, as her treatment for this stroke. So what do you think she would display? What about resolution of symptoms that she had prior? Decrease in weakness and confusion. Okay, like it. So her blood pressure would decrease uh, from her baseline taken upon her arriving at the hospital facility. So it would be less than 144. There'd be no signs of cardiovascular complications like chest pain and things like that. Um, she'd start seeing some resolutions of her weaknesses and she, she wouldn't have any tachycardia, but um, she didn't have it anyway. She had a pulse of 88. Last question. What signs or symptoms would indicate that further treatment is necessary? So this means that, you know, the TPA she received isn't working. So sort of along the lines, we were looking at her confusion and things of that nature. So, you know, if it, 
Um, if they complain of chest pain, then you know this is going to need further treatment. She begins to have weakness in other parts of the body. It's not just on the on the left side; it's now on the right side. Then that will let us know that this isn't working. Yep, loss of function or dysphagia. So any worsening in signs and symptoms. And that was that. So any questions? Does that help you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty straightforward. You still had to know patho, etiology, all of that. You know, where, what do you need to know about it? What kind of folks are affected? This actually incorporated the hemorrhagic stroke a little bit by you to kind of know what it was and how it affected uh, the brain and what's the difference between the two. So, you know, although ischemic strokes are more common, hemorrhagic strokes uh, are more deadly because now we have a, a broken vessel, a broken artery, and you know that's perfuse, supposedly perfusing the brain, but it's now leaking over the brain tissue, causing in, uh, inflammation, et cetera. And we now have a decrease in blood flow to those tissues distal because we have a breakage in that vascular system. So on Wednesday, we'll pick up with, uh, we have uh, Parkinson's and brain tumor, meningitis, and we got grief and loss coming. I just, we've already covered stroke. Gold standard is a CT, that is true. Um, so yeah, we're gonna pick up with Parkinson's, brain tumor, and uh, there was one other one, seizures, you have seizures. So that, that will be the focus. Questions on that? or any other questions you may have. This will post to your DCCD S1 page. And then you can, if you miss the beginning with the test taking strategies, it'll be there. So, you know, don't fret, okay? Any other questions? All right, well then try to enjoy your Saturday before it rains. And you know, you can always do an Easter egg hunt in your house instead of being outside. <laughs> Just think about that. That was the suggestion I gave to my girlfriend for her grandson. I said, you can do the Easter egg hunt in your house. So, all right guys, if you don't have any other questions for me, then I'm gonna sign off and then we will see you guys Wednesday, okay? You are welcome.